Hey everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at AMD's HD5850. Specifically, it's Sapphire's extreme version of the card. Now, what is particularly interesting about this version of the HD5850 is that it actually released quite a while into the release period of the HD6000 series. This, was a this actually came out over six months after the HD6000 series original launched. Now, there was a pretty good reason for that, which I'll go into in a little bit. But um, this particular HD5050, like this actual one that I'm holding in my hands right now, I actually bought this untested off of eBay. Um, I only paid a couple of pounds for it, which you should be seeing on the screen right now, including postage. I paid less than seven pounds, which for a card that regularly sells for 15 to 20 ish pounds on eBay here in the UK. It's a pretty decent bargain. And I say bargain because when I actually received this card, it turned out to be working perfectly fine. Um, only issue I've found so far is that the DVI port doesn't output a signal to the monster, which is perfectly fine for me because I don't use DVI anyway, I just use HDMI and DisplayPort. So considering that it was working perfectly fine, we're going to be doing our usual review today. And we're also going to be testing out the Nymez modded drivers, which you may have heard of before. I actually saw or first heard of these drivers in either Budget Build's official videos or Random Gaming in, in HD's videos. I'm sure both of them have done videos using the Nymez modded drivers, but we're going to be doing that in this video as well. Now, the specs on screen now are what I'm going to be using in a test system, so you can pause it if you'd like to get a better look at them. But for now, we're going to be taking a look at some of the specs and the price of this particular HD 5050, and why Sapphire decided it was a good idea to release the 5050 again after over six months after the HD 6000 series first launched. The reason for Sapphire releasing an at the time previous generation graphics card was simple, really. AMD had plenty of HD5850 chips left over, and Sapphire knew that they could take advantage of that and sell them for cheap. While the HD5850 originally retailed for $300 in 2009, around US$408 today, Sapphire's Extreme version sold for around £110 here in the UK, which is roughly US$180 today as of writing. This was so cheap, in fact, that it actually sold for less than AMD's own then-current-gen HD 6850 and NVIDIA's GTX 460, and yet it could outperform both of them in a number of titles. I've put detailed specs on the screen, but the HD 5850's basics were a core clock of 725MHz and a clock speed of 1000MHz on the 1GB of GDDR5 memory, effectively 4000 gigabits per second due to how GDDR memory works. This was actually no different to the reference HD5850, but Sapphire's extreme version did come equipped with a fantastic cooler which throughout testing kept the card really quiet and below 70 degrees C at all times even while overclocked. Another difference to the reference HD5850 was a slightly cut down number of video outputs, but with one DVI, HDMI and DisplayPort connector, one missing DVI connector really isn't going to matter anyway. To kick off with, it's the Unigen Heaven 4.0 benchmark. This was the first ever DirectX 11 benchmark on its release over a decade ago, and probably isn't overly representative of actual gameplay, at least not today anyway. But it is a benchmark I was quite familiar with in the past, and is good for getting a general idea of comparative performance between cards. Last time out, using the Extreme preset, the GTX 480 I benchmarked scored 754 points, significantly more than the 5850's 395. That's a given, though, obviously, as the 480 was in a much higher end market segment than the 5850 was, but it at least gives you something else to compare the 5850's score to. CSGO is first up for the games today, and 10 years on from its initial release in 2012, it is still one of the most played games today, in fact, at the moment I'm writing this, CSGO is technically the most played game on Steam right now. It has gotten harder to run over the years, but the 5850 doesn't really have much issue running it quite well. Both the Mirage and Dust 2 maps run near flawlessly, with the occasional minor hitch. Dust 2 in particular can have the occasional, occasional, 
occasional moment of stuttering, with it being most noticeable but still not a problem when turning the camera around. So unless you're sitting there looking for it, it's really not going to be an issue at all. That obviously is my subjective view though, others might not necessarily be as tolerant of that. Otherwise things are actually really good on those two maps, with the frame rate on both well in excess of 100 FPS pretty much the entire time. The ancient map on the other hand does have more noticeable micro stuttering throughout, which again is more apparent when you're standing still and turning the camera, but it still isn't to the point where it's going to be intrusive or bad enough to ruin gameplay. You can always turn the settings down to sort this out though obviously, if you're playing competitively, as I know competitive players favour performance war looks anyway, or if you just fancy having things run more smoothly. With Crisis Remastered, the game can launch and run, but not out of the box. The game, as far as I know, uses Vulkan for its implementation of ray tracing on NVIDIA's GPUs, but as the HD5850 doesn't support Vulkan and thus doesn't install the necessary Vulkan runtime with its drivers, the game won't launch. To get around this, you have to download and install the Vulkan runtime separately. It's easy enough to find on Google. And even though the 5850 has no Vulkan or ray tracing support, having this installed then enables the game to actually start. Performance wise though, the game could be quite jarring to watch at times. I was too ambitious with the settings having textures on high, so I'd definitely turn that down to probably the lowest setting, and it might also be worth reducing the resolution to something like 720p and a little, or, or even a little bit below that as well. The most apparent of the issues throughout the test was caused by the memory, so reducing texture quality and resolution would definitely help here. Whenever the game would be loading in a texture, the game would become really stuttery. We'll see later on that overclocking the memory goes some way to fixing this, so I'm thinking it's a relatively low clock speed and therefore bandwidth of the VRAM compared to the game's officially supported graphics card. That's a big factor in this happening. Interestingly though, playing in windowed mode also seemed to reduce how often it happened as well. No idea why, but it helped, at least. Otherwise, the game still has noticeable but brief hitches and moments of micro stuttering throughout. The frame rate can noticeably dip into the 40s in dense jungle areas, which drops further into the high 30s in the most intense scenes. So while the remaster of 2007's Crisis is playable, using these settings at least, it is going to be quite jarring at times. A game I've always sworn against is Fortnite. Having grown up playing first and third person shooters, the building aspect of it never seemed to fit the game or make sense having in the game at all, which pretty much made it unplayable for me given how much of a core aspect of the game it was. But ever since the zero build mode was introduced, I've actually really been getting into it, so I was quite looking forward to testing it again just so I could actually play the game. I was genuinely surprised at how well the 5850 managed to run Fortnite. The only real issues are when you're exiting the battle bus at the start of a match, where the game can stutter pretty badly for a second or two after you jump. After that though, the game generally runs really well other than some quite minor hitches and moments of micro stuttering occasionally. This just goes to show how much the performance rendering mode has done for older graphics cards. Because while it does support DirectX 11, the HD5850 is 13 years old and here it is in 2022 running a fairly well known game quite well. GTA 5 is a decade old next year, yes really, and had its initial release on PC in 2015. Seven years on and it's still near the top of Steam's rankings as one of the most played games today. Ideally I'd probably reduce the resolution a bit, but the 5850 actually does relatively well considering it was already six years old when GTA 5 had its PC release. Throughout the city, we can see some quite minor hitches and moments of micro stuttering. It does become a bit more noticeable in parts of the city, like during the mission where you're chasing Laszlo. And overall, the frame rate generally sits in the low to high 50s range. It gets a lot smoother out on the highway heading towards the desert area, as that tends to be the part of the map where relatively little is actually happening around you. In the desert area itself though, the stuttering does get a bit more noticeable, but still isn't that bad at this point. Probably the worst performing area of the map is the multi-story car park you go into for one of Franklin's assassination missions. Here it becomes very stuttery, but luckily that's not a part of the map you'll be spending much time in anyway, so it doesn't really matter overall. Other areas, such as Vinewood Hills, 
particularly when it's raining hard at night, can also be noticeably stuttery too. But overall, I'm actually quite impressed with how relatively well the 5850 still manages to do. The HD5850 as standard runs at 725MHz on the core, and because you have no access to voltage control, at least on Sapphire's extreme version anyway, you can't really get much more out of it than that. 800MHz is the maximum this particular 5850 managed, which is an increase in clock speed of only 75MHz, or around 10.3%. But both Crisis and GT5 needed a slight drop to 785MHz for stability, which is only 8.3% over stock clocks. The VRAM, on the other hand, managed a 20% increase to 1200 MHz, or 4800 gigabits per second effectively. This translated to an increase in score of around 10.4%, from 395 to 436 points. The 5850, as I'd mentioned earlier, also still manages to stay quite cool and quiet not going any higher than around the high 60s Celsius range throughout Unigen and the rest of the games. Overall, things improved noticeably at CSGO with the overclock. Mirage now runs with no issues whatsoever. We only saw minor, almost unnoticeable hitches on that map pre-overclock as it was, but those are now gone completely. Dust 2 did see an improvement as well, with the occasional hitches we saw previously happening less often now. There could still be some slightly noticeable micro stuttering when turning the camera around, although I'm certain that V-Sync not being on made it seem a bit worse than it actually was. Even then, it's still not going to be enough to notice when you're playing a match anyway. The ancient map still has slightly noticeable micro stuttering throughout and the occasional hitch as well, but neither are enough to ruin gameplay, and again, you can always turn the settings down a bit anyway if you're playing competitively or would just prefer a smoother experience. Otherwise, things are still plenty good enough here. I've not played the other maps, but I think Ancient is probably one of the harder maps to run anyway, so turning down the settings purely for that map probably wouldn't be worth it overall. Undoubtedly the biggest improvement with the Overclock today was in Chrysler Remastered. Pre-Overclock, the relatively low memory bandwidth of the 5850 compared to the officially supported graphics cards was causing severe stuttering at multiple points throughout. But now, while it does still happen occasionally, how often it happens is now significantly reduced. And even then, whenever it does happen, it's not as bad as it was before. We do still see some hitches and micro stutter at times throughout as well though, although again, that's much better now as well. Dent jungle areas can also still drop FPS to around 40, but overall, performance throughout has improved pretty significantly from the memory overclock. The overclock on the core no doubt had an impact too, but with the 5850 struggling for memory bandwidth as it was, an overclock there was always going to make the biggest difference. Fortnite already ran really well without an overclock, so we weren't going to see much of an improvement here, but the second or two of stutter we saw previously after jumping from the battle bus has improved quite a bit. There was still a little bit there, and occasionally it could be just as noticeable depending on what roofs, what roofs, what route the bus took over the map, but for the most part it had improved quite noticeably. Although that is obviously only a small fraction of the game and not part that has any effect on the game itself. Otherwise, the occasional brief hitch is all that remains. I do want to point out though that there had been a couple of updates to the game between tests, and given that the performance rendering mode is still technically in alpha, any updates to the game are a lot more likely to have had an impact on performance than they would have otherwise. Lastly, it's back to GT5. Performance-wise, it's not actually that different from Overclock compared to before, but throughout the test we do still see improvements at various points throughout. Stuttering throughout the city both at night and during the daytime is a bit better, but it is still there, and like stock, it gets more noticeable during the daytime as well. FPS also hasn't really improved much at all throughout the city either. A few FPS here and there, but nothing of note. It's mostly the same kind of story elsewhere throughout the game too, with FPS generally being a little bit higher than it was pre-overclock, but not enough to actually make a difference overall. A highway heading out towards the desert area can still have occasional brief hitches, and again in the desert area itself, stuttering is a bit more noticeable like it was before.
and it's still quite noticeable when it's raining hard at night in and around the Vinewood Hills area and when driving in the multi-storey car park too. Although, to be fair, like stock, performance at no point is bad enough to completely ruin gameplay at all. It's just not going to be the smoothest of experiences at times. But that's not the end of it there, as I did mention we'd also be looking at modded drivers and seeing what kind of boost in performance, if any at all, that they can offer. Specifically, it's the Nymez drivers I've tried out, if that's how you pronounce the name. Um, apologies if I got that wrong. They have drivers supporting the latest RX 6000 series, all the way back to DirectX 11 cards that they use the Terrascale architecture, like our HD5850. But, to cut a long story short, I used the exact same overclock settings that I used for each game with the modded drivers. And to be perfectly honest, performance was no different at all, and if anything, it was actually slightly worse, other than in Crisis Remastered, which did see some quite notable improvements in a couple of areas, but I'll throw up some of the performance charts from the games just now. CSGO ended up performing a little worse, with average and 1% low frame rates around 3% lower than with the official AMD drivers. In actual gameplay, gameplay, in actual gameplay, you wouldn't notice this, but I did notice a couple more quite minor hitches compared to before. Crisis Remastered, while basically the same overall, did manage to noticeably improve in a few areas. Most noticeably was the dense jungle areas in the first mission, where FPS would only dip to around 50 FPS now, compared to around 40 before. This is on top of a slight improvement in how often the stuttering caused by the low memory bandwidth happens. There is around a 2% improvement in average FPS to 58.9 up from 57.8, which is not something you're going to notice at all. And in general, the FPS was pretty much the same as before, other than the parts I mentioned. Fortnite also saw no difference in performance in actual gameplay, although the holding area you're in before a match starts does seem a little bit smoother, but I'm not going to count that as it's, really, as it's not really part of the actual game. There was less than a 1% improvement in average frame rates, so basically nothing, but the 1% low was nearly 15% lower than it was before. I'm not putting this down to the drivers though, I'm putting this down to how much the starting point for a match can vary though, because it's not possible to control where the battle bus goes. GTA 5 did actually see a slight improvement, although overall it was much the same as it was with the official driver. A slight stuttering throughout the city during the daytime was less apparent, and FPS in the desert area of the map, and in around the sandy shores area, was also slightly higher too, although not noticeably so. Although, saying that, and I didn't actually think of this until right now, after I'd already written all of the previous parts of the video, but if the stuttering throughout the city is slightly improved, then given that a lot of the game takes place in the city, it might actually be a worthwhile improvement in the long run, but the stutter in the city with the official driver already wasn't that bad anyway though. So, in conclusion, 13 years on from its initial release, the HD 5850 is still a great little car today. It had its fair share of issues in the likes of Chrysler Remastered, but it is still a reasonably hard game to run, much like its 2007 original. And I was a bit too ambitious with the settings there to be fair as well. Otherwise, I'm really impressed with the performance it can still offer today. On Sapphire's Extreme version specifically, the cooler is also really good at keeping the card cool, all while remaining quite quiet too. So if you're after a cheap graphics card to just play some games, at the less than £20 or €24 US dollars you would pay for this on eBay, it's probably a really good shout. So hopefully you all enjoyed my little look at the HD5050. I'd like to finish off by thanking Patreon supporters Shadow the Void and Matt Sterak, including all of the other Patreon supporters you're seeing on screen right now. If you'd also like to support me in creating these videos, you can do so through Patreon or Ko-fi. Otherwise, if you feel like this video has earned a subscription to my channel, that would be much appreciated, especially if you'd like to see more content like this. But uh, for now, um, thanks for watching the video, especially if you've watched the entire thing up until this point. And hopefully I'll see you in the next one.